Okay, so hello everyone. Good morning in Israel, good afternoon in Asia Pacific. We are starting our webinar uh, and uh, welcome to you all. Thank you for joining us. This is the uh, Israeli Innovation for Port Shipping and Maritime Logistics webinar hosted by the Ministry of Economy and Industry of Israel by the economic offices of Israel around the world and in Asia Pacific specifically and co-hosted together with the DOC, uh, the Maritime Innovation Hub from Israel. My name is Yaniv Goldberg. I'm the head of Israel Economic and Trade Office in Korea, but I'm joined here today with my colleagues, the commercial attaches of Israel from Asia Pacific and all around the world. And with us today are more than 100 participants already, and the number is keep rising. So thank you for joining us. In today's webinar, as you can see in the agenda, we will have some opening remarks by Mr. Hanan Kar Karmeli, the co-founder of uh, the Doc Innovation Hub, and then a keynote speaker, Mr. Madarame from NYK Japan, who will give us a short uh, talk. And then six Israeli innovative companies from the maritime industry will give their uh, short pitches. We will close by a B2B session, a pre-arranged meeting that we ask you to, to submit your requests. Uh, during the webinar, uh, we will publish a poll uh, to ask you for your satisfaction and you are invited also to, to ask for more meetings with specific companies uh, during the poll. Uh, I would like also to thank again the DOC Innovation Hub for partnering with us and for all of you that uh, joined us today. I would like also to say a few short comments. Uh, I put here some pictures of Mauritius and the Beirut port and another port that might be any kind of port all around the world. In Mauritius, uh, recently, last week, uh, we have a still ongoing incident of uh, a MV Wakashayo. It's a, it's a ship uh, that uh, uh, ran uh, across the shore of Mauritius and caused a heavy uh, environmental disaster, mostly, I guess, because uh, they uh, did an accident and, and navigate wrongly. In the Beirut port, I, I guess all of us know what happened and as, as long as uh, still we don't know the, the cause of the accident, but obviously the need for technologies to uh, monitor hazardous materials uh, that are located in ports to make sure that ships are uh, navigating securely around the shores and uh, in deep sea and all kinds of technologies to allow better shipments, better logistics in harbors are a necessity and this is a growing industry nowadays. The six Israeli companies that we'll present today, I believe represent uh, uh, the state of the art of technology in, in those industries. Uh, my last comment will be actually, just look for us at Google, uh, Israel Economic Offices. You will find all the details, all the contact details that you can see here of the different commercial attaches all around the world of Israel. There are 45 offices like that, and I invite you to contact them directly in your uh, respected countries and to uh, uh, talk with them about business opportunities from Israel, by the way, not only in the maritime industry. And last uh, comment, I would like to mention that this is the poll that we will publish once the first Israeli company will start to pitch, and you're invited to fill in the poll during the webinar and until its end. So without further ado, I would like to call uh, to the stage uh, Mr. Hanan Karmeli, uh, the co-founder and managing partner of the DOC Innovation Hub from Israel. Hanan, please. Thank you very much, Yaniv, and the uh, great uh, work and it's great cooperating together with the Foreign Trade Administration and your team, Yaniv, Yoav, and everybody else. And we're delighted to be here on the line, also joined by Mr. Tetsui Madarame, so we know each other already for some time, and it's great pleasure to hosting you as well. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody, and we have, I'm looking at the count here already, uh, close to 170 people on the line, so uh, that's really impressive. Uh, I'd like to say a few words for context. First of all about uh, the DOC, for those uh, who are not familiar uh, with our activity, uh, we are a VC fund, venture capital fund, focusing over uh, supporting and nurturing startups which uh, address challenges in the ports, shipping, and maritime logistics uh, world. This is what we've been doing for the last uh, three years since we were founded. 
uh, we invested today, uh, up to date, in uh, 10 companies, uh, four of which are going to present today, and the two others are affiliated with the doc as well. So we have six great and exciting stories to hear uh, very soon. And uh, maybe I'd like to also put some context about very exciting times in which we are in Israel, which make it a, perf a perfect setting uh, for uh, addressing innovation. And I'm going to relate here to some strategic, maybe even geopolitical, I'll say circumstances, which we all know about, but I'd like to put it together. Uh, so first, a, a strategic uh, aspect of what's happening in Israel in regards with boats and maritime, as many of you know, uh, over the coming year or two, Israel is going to commission two new seaports uh, open to the Mediterranean, two new seaports on top of the two which already exist, which means that Israel is going to double from two to four the number of major uh, uh, transshipment uh, uh, ports. And uh, obviously this uh, triggers a change uh, uh, throughout the economy of Israel, but also uh, increases significantly the maritime cluster with more knowledge, uh, more information coming from the outside. Uh, uh, so many things are happening in that respect. So that's one point. And maybe the other one very shortly uh, from the last few days, we all heard about the peace treaty, which is now in the making between Israel and the United Arab Emirates on top of the excitement that we can all feel regarding that, I believe uh, most people on the line here know obviously DP World, which is a great chain of, uh, of uh, seaports all over the world. So the relations between uh, UAE and Israel also hold the promise uh, towards uh, maybe additional knowledge, additional cooperation around these lines. So uh, uh, the combination of all these, together with uh, global partners, some of which are here in the, on the line, uh, uh, provide for a great climate of, uh, of uh, doing what I will call effective innovation. Not just innovation, but maybe make it practical and down to earth. And uh, speaking about that, I'd like to go back to the here and now and hand it back uh, to you, uh, Yaniv, in order to actually see some examples of what what uh, such innovation could bring about as far as the message uh, to, the, to the maritime sector. So thank you very much, everybody, and back to you, Yaniv. Thank you so much, Hanan. And without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Mr. Madalame from NYK Japan. Mr. Madalame, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much. Let me share my presentation. Mm -hmm. Here. Yeah, good morning to my friend in Israel and uh, very good afternoon to my friend in Asia. I'm Tetsuji Matarame. I'm Tetsuji Madame, Principal Fellow of Digitalization in YK. And uh, I am very honored today to share my experience in finding and uh, working together with Israel uh, startups, in particular maritime and logistics startups you know, for the last few years. And first of all, I'd like to explain the, or introduce ourselves, NYK. NYK stands for Nippon Youth and Kabuchi Gaisha in Japanese. In English, uh, direct translation means uh, Japan Mail Shipping Company. So the, uh, our company was established in 1885, more than 130 years ago, as R Roots Nova Mitsubishi Group. Since then, uh, we are conducting international, international shipping. And uh, recently, we added in our portfolio, logistics, cargo airlines, and the terminal the worldwide, generating the uh, revenue 15.3 billion US uh, last year. Having said that, you know, we are conducting our business with a certain philosophy 
It's a mission bringing value to life. Without proper transportation, cargoes cannot generate their values. Cargoes generate their values after they are delivered to the customer or mills. So that uh, we are very uh, proud of carrying cargoes. No, in particular, at this time, the, we are transporting energy, food, and even medical supplies to our consumers, uh, to our global people. That is our pride, our mission. We conduct this business with uh, around 800 ships, various kinds of ships, as shown here, and 14 Boeing 747 freighters. The uh, very diversified, and uh, we are one of the biggest the uh, shipping company in term in terms of dead weight tons. Having said that, shipping is quite competitive and very very volatile. Supply and demand, freight level, exchange rate, and also bunker price changes very rapidly. So that in order to in order for us to survive, we have to make sure that uh, our customers are satisfied with our services, and we proper we properly conduct efficiently conduct our operations, and with nowadays with environmentally correct way. For that purpose, the NYK set up a midterm business plan titled Staying Ahead 2022 with Digitalization and Green. Uh, for the first time, we had this out in our business plan. And for the last two years, I've been very busy to setting up joint work with uh, tech startups in Japan, US, Europe, Asia, and Israel. So that so far, uh, I'm very happy to share that we've found several reliable and effective tech partners in Israel. Now I change my subject to finding and working with Israel startups. Israel is quite famous that they have many useful tech startups. In comparison to their small area or fewer corporations, they have many, many startups. Maybe because these people are independent and business oriented, and sometimes they are quick movers. Time is money is their philosophy. They contributed, uh, they have many startups. But uh, two years ago, for me, Israel was a rather distant, far country to visit, even farther, to, farther than Europe for me. But uh, two parties helped me to dismantle that barriers. Number one is the Israel Embassy. Uh, I had an opportunity to visit Israel Embassy Tokyo economic division and find out they are pretty much business friendly. Also, quite different from other countries which gave me very thick booklet to show huge number of startups, but Israel didn't do that. Israel embassy conducted uh, interview to make sure our, and we would like to resolve. And based on that interview, they work together with IEI, Israel Export Institute, Tel Aviv. And two, three weeks later, they show me two pieces of very well thought, selected shortlist to have meeting. 
And with that uh, short list, I immediately visit Terra B and conducted certain uh, interviews. And the second party is the doc. To be honest, I'm very surprised because, uh, you know, for example, in the US, transportation related startups primarily focusing on trucking or parcel delivery, they are not interested in maritime. But uh, in Israel, we have the doc of focusing on maritime and logistics and port. It's a kind of miracle for me. But uh, since I met them, uh, we are very working hard to fully make use of their value. So the, the, this is the last piece of my presentation. And uh, I want to share some tips to find and work with Israel startups effectively. Number one is first, think yourself. It's very important to confirm, self-confirm the purpose to visit Israel. Would you like to find out effective solution providers? Or would you like to find out a partner in which you would like to invest your money? Very different. So in our case, in NYK's case, we would like to find out solution provider. Then I learned you know, from my interview with Israel Embassy in Tokyo. Now, what's the point? What's your pain point? What's your problem? What do you would like to resolve with Israel startups? I think these questions are very important to keep, to keep our and your navigation go straight, going straight and effectively and safely. So the point is to confirm your expectation. And also, key two is be clear and specific in communication with Israel startups. In other words, very articulate and straight. The in particular for Japanese, uh, our communication is a little bit ambiguous, but uh, we have to make sure that to tell our expectation very clearly to your partner or potential partner in particular in Israel. And also, they are the people who really think time is money. So it is very important for you to share that time horizon of your project. Then you are going to smoothly work with Israel startups. The third tip is at this moment quite difficult or even impossible, but uh, visit this life. To see is to be able, that's true. So that in this regard, I'm a little bit disappointed that the LR suspended their original uh, Tel Aviv Tokyo direct flight plan, which are originally scheduled uh, March this year that were postponed. But once COVID-19 issue resolved, uh, I think they will resume that plan. And finally, uh, to be honest, I have been asked by my friends as to Israel country risk. I don't think there is no country with that risk. But uh, Israel, you know, when they established their country, they are surrounded by enemies except the Mediterranean. But now Israel is not alone. Uh, 
Journal that Egypt and the recently UAE just shared. So the Israel is uh, now recognized uh, self country. And uh, maybe I can fly on Emirates from Tokyo uh, to Tel Aviv via Dubai. Unless uh, LR open their non-stop flight. And also the another uh, insurance is uh, Israel has a very strong tie with the US, not only military, but economically and the business. Uh, you are going to find out your Israel startups has partners in US that will make your business with Israel startups quite uh, easier. Uh, this concludes my presentation. And now you are going to see uh, many selected uh, Israel startups. It's your turn. Enjoy finding your good partners. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. So thank you so much, uh, Madarame san, uh, for your kind words. Uh, and indeed, uh, I think you're right to say that uh, uh, nowadays the, there are much less barriers to work with Israel as we are uh, concluding our peace accords and relationship with many uh, Arab countries, Arab countries like you heard about the uh, UAE, and even countries like Bahrain and Oman and Saudi Arabia are much more closer to Israel than ever before. So thank you very much for your speech. And without further ado, I would like to invite the first speaker of our exciting webinar, uh, Mr. Uri Yoselevich from DocTech. Uri, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you and just share your screen, exactly. And go ahead. OK. So thank you. That was a nice introduction to Israel on, uh, on the other side perspective. So thank you for that. I enjoy that. Hey everyone, my name is Uri Yoselevich. I'm the CEO and founder of DocTech, and we are helping ships take more cargo in a safer way by creating a digital twin in ports and rivers. So first of all, who we are? We are uh, uh, individual experts from the maritime area and data experts together with our, uh, with our network of, of uh, programs and advisors, we've set the course um, to make this uh, the most successful mission. Uh, so maritime logistics, I think we are all aware of its importance. So I'm just going to skip that and tell you that one of the significant factors in specific in ports and in rivers is water depth. And water depth is an interesting factor. It actually dictates how much cargo can be loaded upon a vessel and how much risk is the vessel taking. So if the vessel is too close to the ground, it's risky, as we've seen in many places around the world. And so there's always a trade-off between how much cargo and how safe you want to be. Well, we found out a way that we can combine the two. So you can have safety and cargo efficiency at the same time. And this, so, so the incentive to gain, you know, additional draft, additional cargo is pretty clear. Just one centimeter of extra draft on a vessel can go a long way. So how are we doing this? We call it a digital twin. Digital twin of a waterway is a digital representation of the bottom and some other environmental uh, conditions. We are doing that by integrating what we call static or semi-static data together with dynamic data. And digital twin has many, many applications. First, we can show what's there, what's going on now. And we can also do some sophisticated simulations to, uh, to optimize cargo and allocate resources, to optimize, sorry, dredging and allocate dredging resources accordingly. And we can also make sure that each ship is using the full capacity of the waterway and taking as much cargo as possible. 
So static or semi-static data is what we have now. Charts, open data, external sources, river gauges, etc. We'll take numerous amounts of data that is open or, or, or uh, uh, open for us and we mix it together with what we call dynamic data. Dynamic data, if you think about it, every ship in port has a lot of, lot of sensors and they are getting better and better as they go. But those sensors, let's think of tugboats in ports for a second. They have echo sounder to know the depth beneath them. They have GPS to know the location. And this data is being generated for the sole purpose of the captain's safety. So we are, we are harvesting uh, this data, making the vessel a, a data mining asset. And we are combining those two and we are representing uh, the results by a web application. In that way, a harbor master, an operation manager can log in, see the current condition, see the current depth, make better decisions and you can even see the forecast of how the bottom is going to look like within a couple of days or even weeks. So in that way, we can make sure that our underkill clearance safe, safety margins are being strictly kept and we take as much cargo as possible. We have several projects around the world that we are super, super proud of and another couple of in, in the pipeline. I would love, love to explore possibilities to be on the east side of this map as well. We are working today with the port of Ashdod together with the Israeli Innovation Authority, which was very, very, very uh, uh, exciting for us because during this COVID-19, we kept of being able to reach out to make sure that the pilot is on its way and, and, and to do the, the, uh, all the to respond to different technical issues and troubleshooting with no problem. So that was very helpful for us. We had another interesting case study in the Mississippi River in the lower part, which is called the ICW in the United States with a tug, with a barge operator. And just three days ago, we started monitoring that in the port of Santos, Brazil. And we already have some first results and first monitoring that we did uh, just with one tugboat that we uh, deployed. So Digital Twin will lead us to a lot of other very, very interesting and exciting uh, possibilities. Risk analysis for vessels, if we can make sure that we are further from the ground uh, uh, and, and give a better risk score for every vessel. And we have a, a large data set of uh, of conditions, of steering commands, and of vessel operations, with me, which will be very important for autonomous navigation and will serve as a data infrastructure for that. And of course, we also collect some environmental uh, uh, data, such as wind, water temperature, which can help us better understand how the weather forecast look like. So I will leave you with that. This is a great uh, short video of, uh, of, um, of how barge operations look like over the Mississippi River. And if, and if one picture is worth a thousand words and there are 24 frames in, in a second, those are 240,000 words right there. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions and my details is right below and we're looking forward to hearing from everyone. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you so much, Uri, uh, for the interesting talk. And indeed, as you said, it's very important to extract data and information in a useful way. So having said that, I would like to mention that I'm now opening the poll of our webinar, and I would like to extract this data from you guys, from all the participants, to tell us what you think. So if you don't want to, to fill in the poll right now, you can put it aside, don't close it, put it aside, and you can fill it later on or by the end of the webinar. So the poll is being launched at the moment uh, and keep following that. And without further ado, I would like to call the next speaker who is Mr. Yair Rudik, the business development manager 
of echo wave power. So Yair, the floor is yours. Can everyone uh, hear me? We can see your slide, put it on full screen, please. There you go, can you see it? Yeah, now we can see it. And uh, I would like to remind the participants that Q&A is open using the button so you can ask during the presentations. Go ahead, Yair. Okay. Hello everyone, my name is Yair Rudik and I'm the business development manager at EchoWave Power. EchoWave Power is a wave energy developer. So we have developed an innovative technology for extracting um, clean electricity from ocean and sea waves. So today, Actually, 80% of total energy consumed um, around the world is derived from fossil fuel-based methods, such as coal, oil, and gas. However, these sources of fossil fuels are finite and are expected to be depleted within the next 100 years. Furthermore, according to the United Nations, energy consumption is actually the largest contributor to climate change, and it accounts for 60% of global greenhouse gas emissions. As a result, we are seeing a more concerted effort to move into renewable energy, which can replace these fossil fuel based methods. You know, the, the growth in renewable energy is expected to grow by 25% by 2040. And 2 trillion USD in new investment is expected into this field by the same year. In addition, 30% of global power demand is expected to be supplied by renewable energy by 2023. So why wave energy? Wave energy is an immense source of renewable power. According to the World Energy Council, we can actually supply twice the amount of electricity the world produces today from our oceans and waves. It also has a number of other distinct advantages. First of all, more than half of the global population is located near a coast, making it an extremely accessible source of renewable energy. In addition, wave energy is a very stable source of power because we can generate from it at both day and night. And in extremely wavy locations, we can actually generate almost around the clock. Furthermore, Wave energy is also an immense source of kinetic energy and it's 832 times the kinetic energy of wind. But the question is, why don't we see wave energy implemented today alongside more established sources of renewable energy, such as solar and wind? Now, the reason that the wave energy field has not commercialized is that most wave energy developers have taken their technologies offshore. So usually four to five kilometers offshore into the ocean. Um, because of that, they were extremely unreliable because there isn't a lot of stationary man-made equipment that can withstand a hit from a 10 to 15 foot wave. In addition, they are extremely complex and expensive. Um, you require ships, divers, underwater cabling, and underwater mooring, making the capexes for these kinds of technologies very expensive. Um, because they were so unreliable and because they were so expensive, um, insurance companies were not willing to insure these technologies. And as a result, if you want to commercialize a renewable energy technology, especially wave energy, um, you have to have insurance for the power stations, and insurance companies were not willing to come in. For this. Lastly, Wave energy is a 100% clean source of renewable power. However, a lot of these offshore systems actually had a negative environmental impact because they required mooring to the ocean floor, which actually disrupted marine traffic and marine migration. So our, our company developed a unique solution, which you can see here, which is actually comprised of unique floaters which are attached to pre-existing marine structures, things like piers, breakwaters, and jetties. The way it works, which you can see here, is that the floaters move up and down with the motion of the waves. Attached to the floaters are hydraulic cylinders which have biodegradable fluid. The movement of the floaters with the waves pushes the biodegradable fluid into accumulators, which generate pressure, which then activate motors, and then generators creating clean electricity. That clean electricity is either sent straight to the grid or to the port or the user of the technology. It's quite a simple system, as you can see. So with our technology, we really answered those other issues that really hindered the commercialization of the wave energy field. First of all, in terms of reliability, um, the majority of our technology is actually located on land. All the expensive equipment, such as accumulators, generators, and motors, are located on land, not in the water. As you can see, only the floaters are located in the water. In addition, we have a patented storm protection mechanism. So in the case that weather um, is too rough for our system to handle, we actually have sensors in the system that monitor the incoming wave batteries. And when waves are too high for the system to handle, it pulls the floaters out of the water and locks them into the upright position, as you can see below. In addition, in terms of cost, as I mentioned, most of the, the expensive part of the system is located on land, with only the floaters located in the water, making our system extremely cost efficient and comparable today with both solar and wind at a cost of 1.2 million per megawatt. In addition, our system is fully insurable because of our competitive costs and reliable. And in terms of environmental impact, as I mentioned, 
we install our system on existing marine structures. We're not introducing anything new into the ocean environment. Because of that, our system is 100% environmentally friendly, and of course, we generate clean electricity. So just to talk a little bit about our development pathway, um, we originally tested our system in the Hydromechanic Institute in Kiev. Um, so then we actually did live testing in the Black Sea. And in 2014, we actually brought our first power station to life here in Jaffa Port, not too far from where I am now. Um, that was an original R&D power station. Since then, we've actually been expanding the power station and we are now um, expanding it and connecting it to the grid with support from the Ministry of Energy of Israel and through a joint venture partnership with EDF Renewables, um, the local Israeli subsidiary of the French electric utility company. Um, we also have a strategic partnership with Simmons for the project and for future projects as well. Um, and like, as I mentioned, we're currently expanding the station, which should be done by the end of the year. In addition, we're also operating a wave energy power station in Gibraltar. Our Gibraltar power station is actually the only grid connected wave energy array in the world, um, which is you know, operating through a power purchase agreement. That project that we've had since 2016 is actually um, the first part of five megawatt power purchase agreement we have with the government of Gibraltar, which is expected to supply the 15% of Gibraltar's energy needs. Um, at the moment, we are actually seeking to develop the first commercial scale wave energy projects in history. So to do commercial scale wave energy power stations. And we already have 252 megawatts of project pipeline worldwide in countries such as the UK, Italy, Portugal, and Australia. Um, East Asia and Southeast Asia is a region that we feel you know, has very good um, the potential for our technology. We think that there is a, definitely a significant demand for our technology um, and a lot of opportunities in terms of coastal communities and infrastructure that can use our technology. And just in terms of ports, we see ports as ideally suited for our technology. Um, because ports often naturally have a lot of existing marine structures such as breakwaters and jetties on which we can install our technology. And in addition, as you probably know better than I do, that ports are large consumers of energy. So we really see our technology as ideally suited for ports as we can uh, you know, use the existing infrastructure in order to create clean electricity and reduce carbon emissions in the port. So, um, just to kind of mention, we've been, uh, our company's been featured on CNN, BBC Forbes, National Geographic, and uh, actually this past year we were really honored to have won the 2019 United Nations Climate Action Award. Um, we're very interested in uh, new partnerships and, you know, as I mentioned, we're looking now to scale and do the com first commercial scale projects worldwide. So um, if you're interested in partnering with us or learning some more about our solution, please feel free to reach out um, at the following email at uh, info at Echo Wave Power or uh, my personal email, just the ear at echowavepower.com. So yeah, ear, uh, that's great. And, and in the time that is left, let's uh, two minutes that are left, let's answer one question that was answered, what, that was questioned. Uh, you can see it in the Q&A button, but I will read it as well. Uh, wave energy. Yes float is facing severe condition with salt water and heavy move, how long does it endure and how do you maintain the power output efficiency? Uh, so if you, in case you can answer this question live, please do so shortly. And if not, we can also answer it later on. Sure, sure. Um, so I think it was just kind of two questions in terms of the corrosive nature of, of the ocean and how we maintain steady output, if I'm not uh, mistaken. Again, uh, how long does it endure and how do you maintain the power output efficiency when it comes to a uh, wave energy and a uh, float of salt? Right. Okay. So the, first of all, just to talk a little bit about our technology, um, the expected lifespan is 25 years. As I mentioned, only the floaters are located in the water. So that's the only part of our system that's actually, um, let's say, exposed to the rough marine environment. It's only a small part and the floaters are fully modular. So meaning that they're interchangeable and they're very easy to uh, service because you can service them from land um, in contrast to offshore wave energy technologies, which you have to take a boat and a diver and go out there and do the operation and maintenance. So we do have quite a robust expected lifespan of 25 years. And like I said, it's quite interchangeable. And in terms of the corrosive nature, we actually use um, a very unique marine paint, um, which is, you know, protects the floaters against corrosion. Um, in terms of the steady output, so of course, wave energy is a renewable energy source. So when there's no waves, we're not going to generate electricity. But as I mentioned um, in the beginning of the presentation, because, um, you know, wave energy is available both day and at night in very suitable locations, we can generate around the clock. Now, in terms of the steady output of our technology, um, part of, you know, 
one that's unique about our technology is we use a lot of off-the-shelf components from leading manufacturers. As I mentioned, we have a strategic partnership with Simmons. Um, and the way we set up the powertrain for our system is using su suitable inverters that, you know, they guarantee steady output to the local grid, you know, based on what they require from us. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Thank you so much, Yair. Indeed, a very innovative source of uh, clean energy. And now I would like to address um, Harbour Technologies. Mr. Boaz Wu, the co-founder and CEO of Harbour Technology, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jeremy. It's all good. Thank you. So Harbour Technologies, I'll start um, with a story. So in November 7, 2007, this ship, the Costco Busan, hit the Bay Bridge, spilled 58,000 gallons of its fuel into the bay. The spill spread very quickly. Uh, this is after one hour, after six hours, after 22 hours, <clears throat> and eventually it hit more than 100 miles of shore and cost more than $100 million. And this is in California, in San Francisco. They prepare for spills and they have all the equipment in the world pretty much. And still these are the results. In general, as we see this week, and I'll talk about it at the end of my presentation in Mauritius, when a spill happens, only seven to 15% of the oil is recovered. All the rest goes into the environment. And there are 20,000 spills annually. We hear about the big ones, but there's a lot of them. So current equipment for this industry hasn't changed for five decades. It's very heavy. You can see the large equipment on the left. Um, it's very bulky. Even with smaller equipment on the right, you can see that it requires trained crews. So what happens today is when a spill happens, we call these people, they are called responders, to come to um, treat the spill. But because of this equipment is so heavy, they come very late. And the spill spreads. So when the crews arrive, it's too late. So what these crews do typically is just clean up. What we intuitively think they'll do is prevent the spill from spreading, but they can't because they arrive way after the spill, is all, the spill has already spread. So Harbo changes this paradigm. We create equipment that can be at standby at every location, that's quick and efficient, that can be operated by anyone. And then you can stop the spill from spreading. We created the world's lightest boom. It's called T-Fence. Um, it comes in boxes like that. So what that means is that people can spread it by with their hands uh, with no ancillary equipment in minutes. And it's also easy and safe to deploy. So if you have a big ship, for example, you can put down a Zodiac that will deploy 200 meters of boom from that Zodiac, which is not possible today. We have um, a few products uh, for different uses. Some of them are multiple use, some of them are single use. And what we really do is we add a new layer of protection. So the existing all response practices, they have their place. But what's missing in this world is a new layer that can respond in the first 120 minutes. Why is that important? If you have a critical infrastructure like a refinery or an oil terminal, or even a ship docking at a port, if you're waiting for three hours, the spill will be very big. The regulators will be there um, and might shut down that facility for a few days. When you try to build a new facility, um, there, you, know, you might have demonstrations because you're not handling oil well. So this is a critical path uh, for, for the publicity of a, of a facility, for saving the environment. Um, that's the left side. In the middle, we're talking about operational effectiveness. If you're using Harbo, you don't need specialized screws. You don't need a, a large vessel. You don't need um, a lot of equipment. It's also very safe to deploy. And especially as we see during COVID-19, when spill happens today, it's much harder to mobilize crews from other countries. It's much harder uh, to travel. And with Harbo, you can keep that um, spill small. So, What's the potential? Why, why, what are we, why are we doing this? So when we think about spills, we think about all the facilities that need to prepare with this equipment. Every port in the world, so for example, uh, Singapore port is our customer. Um, 
every inland waterway where a pipeline crosses it or a train crosses it, all coastal infrastructure, whether it's handling oil or not. So imagine this uh, nice place, you know, remote where there's a factory that's receiving the fuel ship once every few weeks. If they have a spill, instead of waiting for 10 hours, they can deploy a boom in minutes. Every tanker, every oil rig, Coast Guard ships, et cetera, needs our system. We are the first in the world also to offer this as a service. So we're offering equipment, uh, harbor equipment, as a monthly plan. So basically, you can subscribe to have this kind of protection for your facility or for your boat. And I can talk uh, more about that uh, specifically. Um, we're also developing a, an autonomous vessel. And if anybody in this audience is interested to, to be part of that and, and better test this and uh, be one of the first in the world to test it, uh, we're happy to do it. Um, this is a project with one of the biggest defense companies in the world called L3 Harris. It's already um, set to be in the water in October, so you can see it's, it's um, on the top picture that it's ready to go. Uh, this project is sponsored by the EU with, with the Israeli Innovation Authority. Um, we are already been selling for, for two years. Uh, as you can see, the list of customers is quite extensive and uh, impressive. There's different um, verticals here from ports to pipelines to ships uh, to a rig. Um, so all of the, or most of the verticals I, I talked about earlier are represented here. Um, Harbo also is, is very, you know, answering the UN SDGs, uh, quite uh, a few of them, uh, from uh, reducing marine pollution to responsible management of chemicals and wastes, but also upgrading um, infrastructure. Um, this is the end of the slide, but I actually had three more slides, and Yaniv, you talked about more research earlier, so let me talk about that for a second. So the Mauritius spill is a very interesting spill. Um, a bunker, uh, a, a bulk carrier actually um, crashed on their uh, reef and broke up uh, after a couple of weeks on the reef and spilled uh, about a thousand tons of uh, oil into the Mauritian life. Now, the issue there was that a lot of the focus of the international response community was on the ship itself. And that's, that's fine, you need to do that. Um, but the problem is, is that Mauritius were actually pretty much neglected. They weren't of the options for those um, communities. So when the oil travels in these quiet waters and the pictures on the left, you can actually put um, booms and prevent them. And that's where so you look at you know the 200 300 million dollar bill for the spill that you know in the next few years uh, a lot of this damage could have been prevented we could supply 10 kilometers of boom to be deployed by local people um, with uh, of the ship grounding um, and then you don't have to see people you know trying to make boom on the fly uh, and you know again this is applauded they, they really take their lands, but it, this is kind of too late. If you're trying to make booms when a spill is already you, game. Uh, and you're basically just deploying booms there uh, like this. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, happy to answer any questions. So, thank you so much, uh, Boaz. Uh, no questions at this moment, but we, we will collect them later on. And indeed, you shed a light on a very important issue, ecologically and also uh, business-wise. So, thank you for that. And the next one, the next company that we'll present is Logino, uh, with Mr. Shahar Tal, uh, the founder of the company. So, Shahar, the floor is yours. Shahar. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Close yours. Nice. You can share your screen and presentation. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Do you see it? Yeah, we can see. Okay. Awesome. Let me just minimize things here. Great. 
So um, this is a story that I'm going to tell you about a very important thing in our world. This, uh, the shipping container. Uh, these are big boxes with valuable cargo, which are in fact the veins of global economy. Six trillion dollars are traveling in those more than 120 million trips per year. The veins of global economy and nobody knows what's going on. A real situation which you experience every day. Uh, this is a huge problem that causes uh, hundreds of billions of dollars wasted in the entire globe on logistics blindness. People can't manage uh, uh, their logistics because they don't know where the containers are. Customs blindness. You don't know if somebody messed with the containers previously, so everything has to be checked. Insurance blindness. You don't know what's going on, so risk is high. Uh, and my favorite number, 99.9% .9 of cargo is not even checked for security. Uh, it's a real issue. Uh, this is a car manufacturing plant in Guangzhou. Imagine what happens if the bolt of the engine of the car doesn't arrive on time. And imagine the implications to shutting down the production line just because a very small part has not arrived. It means that the supply chain is getting critical and it's getting critical by the month. But it's not just the problem of the cargo owners. It's also a problem of uh, everybody else. Shipping companies, freight forwarders, insurance, customs, homeland security, they are all blind. We are logical that's short of logistic innovation and our mission is to apply the internet of things to create what we call Contopia. Contopia is a relatively new term that we use to describe a world with a 100% smart connected shipping container fleet. Um, if you put it on the other side, we actually turn dumb metal boxes into data miners and the data is the key word here. Uh, data regarding the physical aspects of the container's voyage uh, that is now not available, uh, certainly not as the standard, and data that we claim is super powerful. And why? Because these containers go everywhere and uh, they can answer questions about which port is better, which port is better operating, uh, which trucking company is better performing, uh, well, is my container uh, was, held, was handled well by each and every hand that touched the container along the logistics chain and now multiply it with every port in the world, every trucking company in the world, every shipping company in the world, etc. You get a very powerful set of data, the Google of, the, of logistics, if, if you will. But if we go back to how container monitoring is done today, uh, there's no standard. So you have lots of uh, uh, devices uh, and the common denominator of these devices is that they are sold bypassing the shipping company and are sold directly to shippers. Uh, and because of that, the shipper needs to install the device and then it has to take it off um, at the point of destination. It's a huge and very complex and very costly operation. Uh, whereas the other way around, our solution is to partner with the shipping company, the owner of the container, and provide a solution that completely and permanently transforms a container into a smart container. And that's how you can deliver more or less the same data, if not more, at a fraction of the cost of, with absolutely zero headache to the shipper. Uh, using military technology that was previously uh, unavailable to the uh, commercial sector, we developed uh, this brain. It's a small device that actually looks and installs like a standard container vent. We got it patented. And uh, the nice thing about it is that it is leagues above your normal GPS tracker, uh, meaning that it can sense many uh, things around the container. Uh, it could detect lifts, could detect on which platform the container is on. Very similar to your smartwatch that knows how many steps you've taken, how well you've slept. We do this kind of analysis in device, uh, but related to shipping containers. So we have a lot of insight about the shipping container and its contents. Uh, very smart device uh, with very smart features, one of which is something that we're um, developing right now, is Solus VGM weighing 
of the container just by the vibrations and the acoustics, we've already got a patent for it, uh, a granted patent for it. Uh, so uh, a very exciting feature that's gonna come out. Uh, and uh, we're the only company in the world that has an existing uh, pre-trained installation infrastructure because uh, every depot around the world can install it because it's exactly like installing a container vent and they already know how to install a container vent and they already negotiated the prices to do it. Uh, coupled by simple but super smart predictive analytics software, we're able to do a lot of uh, things in Contopia uh, and we're able to really transform uh, shipper logistics into uh, something that uh, is worthy of the 21st century. Uh, we're also working on many Contopia use cases, such as a uh, virtual seal to replace uh, the physical seal of the container, a black box for insurance purposes. We talked about scaleless weight measurement, uh, operations efficiency, uh, and predictive schedule analytics. They're all part of Contopia. Uh, and I want to take you back to early 2019, and that's where we um, made mature technology. We were sure that uh, we have a great idea, strategic market, disruptive business model, proven technology, patents, everything's ready, but we didn't know if the market is ready. So we said, let's test it. And we issued a competition to all shipping companies, uh, 150,000 uh, containers and less. Uh, with some really nice um, partners. And uh, we asked those shipping companies to tell us what are they gonna do if tomorrow morning they're gonna have their entire container smart uh, and see which would be the better answer. Uh, we had 17 shipping companies applying to this competition, four shortlisted, and one company announced last year uh, as the really first ever digital shipping company who declares they're gonna uh, uh, convert their entire container fleet to smart containers. This is a feat that has not been done until now. Uh, without further ado, if you know the story, then you know who won. If you don't, uh, these are the winners. Uh, the CEO uh, and uh, the operations manager of that company uh, and the two founders, including myself. Uh, in the announcement that was done in Oslo last year. Uh, it's a Brazilian public company called Login Logistica uh, Intermodal. Uh, they're one of the top three cabotage players uh, in uh, Latin America. Very interesting company. We got tons of press uh, doing uh, the Contopia Factor competition. Uh, the review was covered uh, worldwide. Uh, and since it's a public company, we can see what happened to the stock. And this is what happens to a shipping company that declares, uh, you know, just on a, on a step of declaration that declares that they're going to go uh, digital. Okay. Uh, very, uh, you know, shipping company uh, characteristics, very solid. But once we declared in 6th of June, uh, they started behaving like a technology company. Uh, stock rose up and became... Uh, more uh, um, with more frequent changes. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is what happens when you declare that you're going to go digital. The market really responds. And I can tell you right now that we're in the middle of the um, setup uh, processes. Uh, almost uh, um, in a month, we're going to do the full commercial uh, rollout. Uh, and in a month, we're going to do the first, we're going to be the first shipping company in the world that offers smart container services to their entire customers. The first one is gonna do that. Uh, market is responding and I can tell you that customers are responding as well. Uh, this is actually making Contopia a reality. As I've said, uh, for the first time in the world that we have a sandbox of a shipping company that is playing it digital in a full scale, not pilots, uh, not uh, tests, uh, it's the real deal. Uh, what we also do is that we, uh, uh, under Cotopia Labs, we do some use cases which are uh, a little bit more for the future and a little bit more uh, science fiction. Uh, if uh, we focus on the customer use case and on the shipping company's operations use case, in Cotopia Labs, we um, 
measure better risks for insurance companies. We measure better, better connectivity with the smart port uh, and all sorts of things that are uh, relevant to future business models, not uh, vessel connectivity, container and vessel connectivity, uh, these kinds of things. So we're keeping it very real and very economical uh, in uh, uh, the Contopia scenario and in Contopia Labs, we think about the future. Uh, and we did all this uh, with a very, very small seed investment. So we're also very efficient uh, as a startup. Uh, so, that's it. And we invite uh -huh. you to think outside. Yeah, so container. sorry to interrupt you, Shahar, but there are three yeah. quick questions and I would like to ask you to answer them very shortly. So okay. let's go through them. How can we track the accurate location of a container in real time as well? This is the first question. So go ahead shortly answering that. So uh, there's a lot of difference between the shore and the sea. Uh, most of the tracking is done on shore. Uh, we use uh, several technologies, mostly cellular, but also short range. Uh, the shore is really not a problem. Uh, on the vessel, uh, there's an issue. Uh, we, instead of tracking real time, we give the location of the vessel. It's good enough for what, uh, uh, or let's say it's the best that we can do. What we are working, we have a very big partner that we're working on uh, vessel connectivity uh, with. So every shipping company that we're going to work with, uh, they will have the option of converting also their vessel fleet, of meshing their vessel fleet wirelessly uh, not a huge cost, by the way. Uh, and in that way, you will have also real-time connectivity at sea. Uh, okay. But since 99.9% since .9 of events do not happen at sea, today it's uh, manageable, manageable. And what we have is like leagues above everything that's uh, already existing. So, so Okay. And, and, and then a quick answer to the second question. How is the smart device powered? Uh, mostly solo. And it lasts for 10 years. So uh, the usual lifetime of a container. You put it on once and you don't take it off. Okay, and, and the last quick one uh, to the question, uh, how many day the battery life of one, your, one of your devices? I think you just- 10 years. That. 10 years, yeah. yeah. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Shahal. Uh, and indeed, we are looking forward for this uh, container Utopia. So thank you for your presentation. And now I would like to ask Mr. Yarden Gross, the co-founder and CEO of Oka AI, to go ahead and the floor is yours. Thank you, Anib. Thank you. Let me show the screen one second. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, hope you're enjoying these presentations. Um, my name is Yarden Gross. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Oka AI. Uh, let me... Yaniv, can you see the screen? Can you hear me well? Okay, so me very well, today. Great. So uh, I started a company in uh, 2018 with my co-founder, though. Um, we know each other actually 12 years. We both served in the Israeli Navy and been operating uh, Navy vessels, so extensive background in the marine domain. Uh, also, we have uh, extensive background building technology for uh, autonomous cars um, and, you know, so, so and, and the vision right from the start when we started Orca um, was to enhance safety and efficiency of operations uh, by developing more autonomous capabilities. So we see it very similar to the aviation industry where today you have a pilot sitting in the cockpit, but 95% of the time he's not flying the airplane. The computer is actually doing that. Uh, with shipping, everything is still very manual. So this is how we see the, the maritime industry going forward, it, it's going to be a gradual steps um, and it's going to take time. So today we are, what we're doing is actually building the technology infrastructure for doing that. And um, we are not yet taking control of the vessels, rather assisting the crew on board to be more aware of the surroundings, take better decisions, life saving decisions, and also connect mm -hmm. the ship and the data that comes from the ship to the shore side and creating transparency uh, for operations. So just to frame the problem that we are solving, today you have about 4,000 accidents and incidents happening annually. And this number actually growed and almost doubled itself in the last five, five years, mainly because waterways are becoming more congested, so you have more trading, 
and, and it becomes harder to navigate. And also constantly we're getting the feedback from our customers that the crew on board is less experienced than it used to be in the past. It's, higher, it's hard to hire experienced crew and to retain them. Um, and when you look at the root cause, why these accidents are still happening? Um, first of all, most of them, of course, are happening not in the open ocean. They're happening in congested waterways. So entering in ports, straits, canals. Southeast Asia is, is a very congested area, usually, if you're talking about the Straits of Malacca, uh, Singapore Straits, um, and Chinese Sea, and other places in the area are very congested. And when you look at the existing navigation tools, they are not suitable to handle these type of congested areas. And um, they produce a lot of false alarms, misdetections. As you can see here in the left picture, this is a picture I took from a blog post of an experienced captain. He's explaining that uh, with existing tools here, specifically outside of Singapore, basically you're not getting the full visibility, which leads to the fact that most accidents are caused because of human error. So we started thinking, you know, when we started building the company, what we can develop that is going to be a game changer it's going to enhance the capabilities of the crew to be more aware of the surroundings take better decisions um, and navigate safely and we understood right from the start that we need to build a holistic solution that will collect data from all navigational inputs in real time but also to add another sensor that is designed for these congested areas what you see here is a lookout unit. It's a combination of high resolution cameras with thermal cameras to detect small objects from far away distances and doing it also in low visibility and pitch black night. But then what we're doing, we're actually fusing the data that comes from the cameras with existing sensors, with the radar, AIS, GPS, for those of you who knows that. And then we are feeding the data to a learning algorithm that is constantly analyzing it and producing the, uh, the insights in real time. Uh, I will jump into the technology in a second. Just before that, a few words about the company. We started developing the technology in 2018. Just a couple of months ago, we got to a point where the technology is commercialized uh, and we started uh, working with uh, leading shipping companies, oil majors, ship owners. Uh, we have uh, discussions and, and collaborations also with uh, the classification societies in the standard in the market. Um, and now we have also discussions with shipbuilders and our other technology manufacturers for uh, further, uh, further developments. Um, and in terms of the, the integration to the ship and how you install it, so this, this video is actually from installation we did two days ago. Uh, on a tanker in, the, in Greece. So the installation is very easy. It takes us only six hours to integrate the entire system for, to the vessel. Uh, it's very plug and play in a way. Um, and we installed the lookout unit here. You can see it's on the Monkey Island on the top of the ship to get the full visibility. The screen is inside the bridge and you're getting all the information immediately to the screen in real time. Uh, in terms of the technology, we designed Orca Every line of code, all the algorithm, all the data, everything is designed to the marine domain. Uh, the marine domain, as you know, is a very complex environment. You have low visibility conditions, pitch black night. Uh, the first layer of the technology is to be able to detect objects in a very high accuracy. Uh, we're talking about a collision avoidance system. We're talking about human lives. We had to build uh, an object detector that will know to how to detect objects in a very accurate way and actually to be able to handle all these complex scenarios, uh, as you can see, for example, in, the, in, this, in these photos. And after detecting the object, then we are sending that to the classifier. The classifier actually classifies between different types of objects. And this is the beauty about using cameras. Um, you can actually put context in situations, very similar to how our brain works. When you're looking at something and we understand the type of object, we understand and we'll be able to predict how it's going to behave. So here we can classify between oil rigs, between bridges, between different type of vessels, fishing vessel, container ship, super important because a fishing vessel, for example, is behaving, it's, net, it's operating differently from a big container ship. So if you want to predict the, the maneuverability of, of the object, you need to be actually classify between them. After detecting the object classified, then we actually placing it in the environment. The technology we built is to be able to measure distance 
only using camera. This is a very unique technology. Orca is the only company in the maritime industry is doing that. And it's very important because the only way to measure distance today is with a radar. Radar is fine, but once again, you get into congested areas, you can miss a lot of objects. And by that, not trigger any type of alarm. So now with the technology we built, you can actually measure distance and bearing to any detected object only using cameras and by that trigger any type of alarm uh, that wasn't triggered before. So once you detect, classify, understand where the object is in the environment, on top of that, you can actually now build a smart alarm system uh, that takes into account all these type of parameters. So the visibility outside, the weather, the type of vessel, um, the, ve the velocity, and actually provide a sophisticated alarm uh, to, to the crew on board to be aware of dangerous situations and to take the right action. When you combine everything together, this is how the engine of the algorithms looks like. So this, I love to show this, uh, this video because um, we are fitting the algorithm with visual data. And the green lines you can see here, this is the data that counts from the complementary sensor, so from the existing sensors on board. And I like to say that this is how the captain actually sees the world because the captain is looking outside usually. He sees and detecting the object, the target with his line of sight, and he's going to play with the clutter of the radar. He's going to get more information from the AIS. And it's a very manual process, very tedious process. So Olga is actually connecting all the dots together and doing it in milliseconds. And then package it in a very nice user interface and then this is what we're showing to actually to the captain on board and to the crew. So detecting every object around the vessel in a very high accuracy, classifying between them as a, we classify this one as a buoy and, a, and this one as a vessel. So once you press on that, you get all the relevant information needed uh, as a distance, the type of vessel, the course of the ground, speed of the ground, CPA, TCPA, everything needed to, uh, in order to take the decision. And you can switch between left, center, right camera, then of course the thermal view, for pitch black night uh, to get full data, as you can see here. And uh, this is one of the push boats we installed on in, uh, that is traveling in the Mississippi River. So th this is regarding the system that we install on vessels and we constantly keep updating that, collecting more data. And this data is crucial because more we are able to get better capabilities and train our models. And what we learned in the last couple of months is that ships are becoming more connected. And the shore side office actually wants to be able to, or other stakeholders in the shore side will want to get the transparency on what is happening on the ship. And we are exactly on this intersection. We are actually collecting all this data and now we can utilize it to create transparency to other stakeholders. So first use case that, that we built was to be able to collect the data to the cloud, send it and store it in the cloud, and then provide access to uh, other stakeholders. Here in this specific uh, case, we did a collaboration with, uh, with Shell and we worked on a remote audit navigation tool. This is the fleet safety dashboard that basically provides uh, transparency on how the ship is being operated. Uh, we understand if there was any near misses, if there was any dangerous situations, um, if the ship was operated uh, exactly by the color regulation, um, and we can present this type of information in a very intuitive way, uh, and then provide a full visibility on the entire fleet and the risk and dangerous uh, encounters. So this okay. is just an example of a video for yeah, what I'm we can to add, But we are short in time, so please try to wrap it up. Yes, we this we finished. This is the last uh, slide. So this is the, the transparency that we can actually, uh, that we can actually uh, give to other stakeholders. Um, we're looking forward to work with uh, more shipping companies, other uh, ship owners, um, and great that you're here. Thank you very much. Okay, so thank you very much, uh, Yarden. And I would like now to give the floor to uh, Mr. Gadi Rushin, the CEO and co-founder of WAVE. So Gadi, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Yaniv, and uh, thank you very much also, Hanan, and for everyone for arranging this excellent uh, uh, webinar. I'm sharing my screen. Um, 
So as Yaniv mentioned, my name is Gadi Rushin and I'm the co-founder and the CEO of Wave. We've discussed a lot about uh, um, logistics and shipping in general. Uh, and I would like to add another layer of uh, uh, complexities and inefficiencies which are more related to trade. And this is of course uh, the vast use of paper documents which are still used along the supply chain and in trade. These documents of course will also travel uh, between your customers, between the buyers and sellers, the banking industry, uh, insurers, which mean that trade eventually is the largest network uh, uh, in the world uh, and includes practically the entire B2B world, and it is still extremely paper-based, which means that, uh, of course, the most famous document uh, is the Bill of Lading, which is a document of title to the goods in transport. Um, of course, our, uh, uh, in the audience, the carriers will know this document because they issue it, and it's a very important document for them. Um, the corporates uh, on this session will definitely identify it as well. Um, because they use it and this is how they control the shipment. And this, of course, is still done in a paper format, which is traveling between the different participants along each and every supply chain. Um, of course, using paper is extremely inefficient, it is expensive, uh, it is slow, which means that the typical trade transaction will take between 10 to 14 days just for the documentary flow uh, to travel between the different participants. Uh, in some unique cases, it, it will even take more, and this is without having any human errors or, or without having any uh, discrepancies on the documents themselves. The COVID-19 situation has actually pointed out even more, um, or, or let me rephrase, there is a known saying in the B2B world that if it ain't broken, don't fix it. Uh, during the COVID-19 uh, um, epidemic, uh, actually paper have caused trade in some cases, not of course all of trade, but in some cases it brought it to be broken, which means that the, the risk is dramatically higher. Natixis Bank lost $46 million just like week, just last week for forged documents. Uh, last month, HSBC was involved in two commercial disputes involving for, uh, uh, over almost $100 million in uh, uh, financing over forged documents. Um, in India, the ports kept on running uh, quite normally. However, the planes, the, the courier airplanes could not land. Uh, so the ports were flooded with containers and there was an actual sh worldwide shortage of containers because everything was stuck. It arrived to the port but could not be released because of missing documentation. Solution is of course digitization. Digitizing international trade is a long mission already uh, experience or, or I would say pushed by many industry participants for, for many years. The banking industry are the biggest uh, uh, evangelists of uh, trade digitization because they would like to, of course, provide a better service to their customers. Uh, when banks are involved, there, isn't, there are no workarounds, no way bills, no telex releases and nothing else. Um, but of course, also the industry participants themselves, uh, the carriers, uh, buyers and sellers, which are still uh, require full uh, dependency on the paper documents. Um, WAVE, of course, is doing exactly that, which means that WAVE is a tool that is designed to digitize, electron to digitize original documents while keeping the commercial and a, a commercial, legal, and a, any other aspect, which means that we mirror paper, but in a fully electronic format, um, just to give you some sense of the savings that can be uh, uh, done using trade digitization. So our uh, breaking, uh, our fastest transaction that involves the banking industry, of course, if banks are not involved, we can digitize the transaction from days to practically 10 minutes. Uh, however, when you add the banking industry, so of course, it's, it's a slightly more complicated transaction. Our fastest ever transaction with the banking industry was done with BBVA a couple of years ago, and we managed to complete a full letter of credit transaction in two hours and 37 minutes, including a solving of discrepancies, which means that one of the documents was not electronically signed, but still we managed to complete it within less than three hours. And of course, it's much, much faster than 14 days. Always bear in mind that sometimes the shipment takes only two to three days, or sometimes even overnight. So of course, digitizing the transaction is 
crucial in many cases. Um, our platform is designed to be as simple as an, and as instant to, uh, uh, to deploy as possible. The logic behind it is that in order to digitize trade, you need a very large network. You need to have the buyers, the sellers, the trade forwarders, uh, carriers, banking industry, sometimes even regulators are involved or government agencies. Uh, so we designed Wave not to improve trade or not to streamline, but just to digitize it, which means that uh, today, uh, in a second, I will explain about the carrier's activity, uh, but on board a buyer or a seller, which means that importer or exporter can onboard instantly, which means that within five minutes, the network can already start receiving their documents electronically from their current existing uh, um, service providers. Now, on top of that, they will not need to have any internal changes, which means that a uh, onboarding wave can be done in a fully standalone uh, mode without connecting it to any ERP, EMS, or any other system uh, that your organization is, is uh, managing its transaction with. Uh, of course, you can also integrate it, the large carriers, MSC, Zim, uh, others as well, and, and of course, in the banking industry are already working on integrations in order not only to save the external time of documents transportation, but also to streamline internal operation, reduce, me, reduce manual uh, uh, operations and, and FTEs, in order to streamline uh, trade and completely automate it, uh, because eventually uh, every member of the supply chain also has other activities on top of the documents. So let's focus on that and not on moving paper documents around the world. Um, why, why should you even do it? So the savings for organizations can sum up to millions of dollars per year. At DCSA, which is the Digital Shipping Container Association, which we, of course, are members of, uh, supporting, not in members, only carriers can be full members, um, have calculated that if we reduce before, uh, only 50% of, of the use of paper in the supply chain, the industry will save around $4 billion. Um, Maersk have calculated that in many cases, the handling of documents will cost between 20 to 25% of the actual cargo uh, uh, of the cost of the cargo which means that um, the savings for digitizing documents are not just courier envelopes or paper and ink which are also important and sums to sums up to huge amounts but uh, uh, the, the savings will be uh, uh, enormous per organization for example one very large japanese uh, conglomerate which is now evaluating uh, um, wave and um, got his eureka moment when he realizes that every shipment that he is doing, the documents will be sent from the country of origin to Japan for internal processing and then forwarded to the destination. Almost every transaction will have uh, demerge costs. Um, so the use of paper is creating enormous costs, but also many risks. Of course, forge of bills of lading or a cargo theft while releasing cargo without the original bill of lading is something which is happening on a daily basis. And of course, paper is also tend to, to get lost every now and then. And when a bill of lading is lost, it's, it's a big issue, uh, provide, bringing a bank guarantee of, double the, of minimum of double the amount of the goods in transport is of course a very problematic uh, um, activity, both for the importer but also for the shipping company itself, or for the carrier. The network workforce is fully active and uh, alive. We are already active almost all around the world. Actually, five is not very accurate because we already have activities also in uh, Africa. We have, a, a, since the COVID-19 situation uh, uh, initiated, this was our tipping point, and we moved from uh, uh, dozens of bills of lading per week we are now doing uh, uh, dozens of bills of lading per day, summing up to a lower thousand already on a, a monthly basis. A 47.6 of the container shipping industry, which is the top uh, top 11, are already uh, rolling out wave. Uh, MSC and Zim are currently uh, uh, already in full production, and if you are using their services, just contact your local uh, representative office and request wave and very soon after uh, you will be already fully digitized and they will also assist you to onboard your uh, customers on the other side. 
Uh, the banking industry, of course, are slightly slower to adapt. However, because of the high motivation, so 19 banks are already accepting bills of lading uh, in a controlled environment, which means that in, in a pilot mode, but early next year, they will all be rolling out. Wave has already finished proof of concepts and pilot with 68 different banks. All of them are progressing uh, towards production, but of course, because of regulatory barrier, the adoption is relatively slow. They have to uh, check it all, but large uh, uh, players like HSBC, uh, US Bank, Wells Fargo, uh, ANZ, many banks in Asia, uh, in Europe, and in the US are already uh, accepting uh, bills of lay or electronic documents. Wave, of course, is not just for the bill of lading, but for all the documents, uh, including packing lists, invoices, certificates of origin, and all others. Uh, corporates, uh, the numbers are jumping on a daily base. We currently have 440 active corporates, which are working or fully digitized their activity as well already. Uh, the numbers are growing on a daily base because Currently, the network deployment is actually done by the carriers. You can join now and work together with us, with the founding team, or you can just wait a, a little while and then the carrier will offer you because, of course, digitizing trade is an, is an industry mission. It's not something which is, it's not just a traditional startup. It's a network-based activity which is led by the ocean carriers today. Uh, all of them are aligning, all of them are offering, uh, the majority is offering WAVE, uh, the rest will follow up uh, as well, and uh, we look forward for a fully uh, digitized industry. Of course, uh, from all the different aspects of trade, WAVE is fully uh, uh, accepted all around the world, which means that if you have a commercial dispute and the bill of lading will need to go to court, of course, this will be accepted. Uh, we are fully approved by the IGPNI uh, uh, club. Uh, or club, which are the insurers of the carrier. We, fought, we are fully complied with the International Chamber of Commerce, the Unicitral, uh, DCSA, all the different standards that exist, as well as the EAT fund, because eventually WAVE will own not, not only replace bills of lading, but also bills of exchange, prom notes. This is the, the, this is the Pareto of WAVE, digitizing, trade, digitizing documents, not only bills of lading. So of course, we are already working on other financial assets, such as bills of exchange, prom notes, which are also used either by yourselves or by your customers. All of them are sent today in the same courier envelope, and we would like to provide full paperless trade experience, and uh, we are working towards that uh, from all the different aspects. So we invite you all to either contact us directly or your uh, uh, carriers uh, in order to onboard and to, to join the digitization of the industry. The savings or the efficiency of trade will be unbelievably uh, uh, noticeable for every organization. Um, the amount of time which is lost just for waiting for documents to arrive uh, is going to be slashed uh, dramatically as well. And uh, we invite you to join. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Gadi. Uh, and I would like, uh, we are not finished yet, so just last few short no, uh, notes. So the poll is actually still open and I invite you all to fill in the poll. And actually one of the main questions that we would like to ask you following this webinar is, would you like to set an online meeting with one of the Israeli companies or with the doc? And this is the time to fill this up. So thank you for listening. But now the time is to fill up the poll and let us know what is your opinion and feedback uh, about this webinar. Uh, Another comment I would like to mention again that if you'd like to continue working with the Israeli economic offices at the Israeli embassies around the world, finding out about more Israeli technologies in various sectors, but also in the maritime sector, you are most welcome to find our details in Google. Just click Israel economic offices and you will find the contact details of our offices. And now while you're filling up the polls, I would like to ask Mr. Hanan Karmeli to try and answer a question that was asked during the uh, uh, webinar uh, about the future trends that we think that will be dominating the maritime uh, industry. So very shortly, Hanan, can you share with us your thoughts? 
Sorry, Anil. So uh, the question was about the uh, prominent technologies specifically for ports, which is one major area. And I'll say, I'll cite maybe three areas that we see a lot of interest, both from a uh, pool side, pool side there I'm referring to the market, but also push side uh, from uh, startups operating in the area. So the prominent technologies for ports that we see, the three areas, one has to do with, uh, I will say, data analytics and the, and the optimization, operational optimization of ports. And uh, just to give uh, an idea, this relates to different uh, queue optimization, optimization of queues of trucks, uh, of, uh, of uh, queues of uh, cargo operations, uh, berthing and anchorage uh, operations, scheduling of such. So these are different aspects of optimization. Uh, which usually could be also viewed as supplemental components to the terminal operating systems, to the TOS systems of the port in some cases. So this is one area. The second is uh, autonomy, autonomy of cranes, autonomy of uh, uh, AGVs, uh, uh, different aspects of uh, autonomy of, uh, of uh, uh, equipment in the ports. And the third area, is around the HLS Homeland Security and Safety. These include the gate technologies and different aspects of HLS and safety, which plays a significant uh, factor in port operations. So in general, Yaniv, these are, these are the areas of interest uh, in response to that question. Okay, exciting and very interesting. And by that, we are about to finish our webinar for today. So I'd like to thank all of you, all the participants, all the panelists, the DOC, all the Israeli companies, and of course, all the participants from various countries. And thank you for listening. Thank you for filling up the poll. And we will finish by now. And now we are starting actually a B2B session with the Israeli companies. So for all of you who already set the meeting, you know about it and you are supposed to start the meeting right now. So once again, thank you very much and have a nice day. Bye-bye. Thank you.